Hail Caesar, emperor of salads and ruler of Mexico. That's right, the Caesar salad was actually invented in Tijuana, Mexico. And I'm going to do my best to make that original version of my favorite salad from the 1920s. So thank you to Wondrium for sponsoring this video as we make the original Caesar salad. Maybe. This time on Tasting History. So like so many dishes out there and lots of cocktails as well, lots of people in different places have tried to take credit for inventing the Caesar salad. Most people do agree that it was made first in Tijuana, Mexico, but even then there's still a lot of controversy about exactly how it all went down, probably in the 1920s. And the first written version wasn't done until the 1940s. It's from a 1946 article called The Voice of Broadway. The big food rage in Hollywood, the Caesar salad, will be introduced to New Yorkers by Gilmore's Steakhouse. It's an intricate concoction that takes ages to prepare and contains, zowie, lots of garlic, raw or slightly coddled eggs, croutons, romaine, anchovies, parmesan cheese, olive oil, vinegar, and plenty of black pepper. But she's not describing that original Tijuana salad there, she is describing a version that was going to be made in New York. And they're very similar, but there are some key differences, most notably anchovies. That's right, the original Caesar salad, by all accounts, did not have anchovies. In fact, its purported creator, Caesar, who it's named after, was rather insistent that there were no anchovies. Instead, he had Worcestershire sauce added and said that all the anchovy flavor necessary came from that. So in an effort to make the original Caesar salad based on his recollections as well as those of his daughter, what you'll need is about two cups of cubed day-old Italian bread, two cloves of crushed garlic, and three to four tablespoons of olive oil. So that is for the croutons. And if you have a little bit too much bread or not quite enough or too much garlic or whatever, it doesn't matter. All of the ingredients in this recipe are kind of up to you, up to your taste. Even today, they make it table side at the restaurant where it was originally done. And they're just throwing things in. Uh, nobody's doing any measurements, so you don't need to either. For the dressing, you'll need two cloves of garlic crushed, two thirds cup or 160 milliliters or more of extra virgin olive oil. And on Caesar's insistence, that olive oil does need to be imported from Italy. Granted, he's, he's not here, so if you don't have that, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But he also says the same thing about the quarter cup or about 25 grams of freshly grated Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Then two medium heads of romaine lettuce, a half teaspoon of kosher salt, one large egg yolk, plenty of fresh ground black pepper, the juice of one lime. So a lot of people actually use lemon instead of lime, and that probably stems from a translation error, because in Mexico they call limes limon. And so, you know, Americans heard limon and thought, oh, lemon, and so now it's usually lemon, but it should be a lime. And then two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. And that word, Worcestershire, I feel like it causes a lot of stress, especially with Americans. Nobody ever says it with a lot of gusto. It's like, and I feel like most of the confusion comes from the first part of the word, Worcester is pronounced Worcester, because no English place name ever sounds the way that it's written. Beaver Castle, Chumley. It's something that really stresses me out when I go to Britain, which when this episode airs, I will actually be in Scotland. So to prepare myself for the eventual embarrassment of pronouncing things wrong, but to try to get better as well as to help plan my trip, I have been watching The Great Tours on Wondrium, who happens to be our sponsor. Wondrium, formerly The Great Courses Plus, never fails when it comes to finding a course to teach me about whatever it is I want to learn. Now, usually I'm watching courses on history or food, but this course is actually about travel. And the course was perfect for helping me plan out my trip, because not only does the professor tell you about different places to see, some very famous and some a little bit more off the beaten path, but he also gives little anecdotes about each one, many of which are historical like a story about the Scottish border reavers who were constantly raiding villages around medieval Glasgow, and the archbishop's decision in 1525 to curse them. I curse their head and all the hairs on their head. I curse their face, their eyes, their mouth, their nose, their tongue, their teeth, their skulls, their shoulders. He actually continues this for quite some time, basically going all the way down to the soles of their feet. 
and it seems to be a rather slow acting curse seeing as the border reavers were around raiding for about another hundred years. So next time you're planning a trip, or frankly any time you want to learn pretty much anything, just visit wondrium.com slash tastinghistory or click the link in the description to start your free trial. That's wondrium.com slash tastinghistory. Now let's make this salad. So first take the romaine lettuce and cut off the base. Then strip away the outer leaves until you get to the nice crisp romaine hearts. You'll need about 20 of them in all. Then wash them well, and then put them into the refrigerator for at least an hour, uncovered, so that they dry out and get nice and chilled. Now for both the croutons and the salad itself, you want to get a very big bowl. They use a big wooden bowl at the restaurant. It doesn't need to be wooden, but you want it big because uh, you're going to make a mess otherwise. Um, you, you can do it in smaller bowls, but you can do everything all in one bowl and have less to wash. Now when it comes to the croutons, the restaurant today, they give you like one big crouton on top. It's cool looking, but not very practical in my personal opinion. So luckily the original seems to have been much smaller, more traditional croutons. So to make those, mix the garlic with the three to four tablespoons of olive oil and add a pinch of salt and a crack of pepper if you want. Then add in the bread and gently toss it until it's well coated. Then spread it out over a lined baking sheet and put it in the oven at 375 degrees Fahrenheit or 190 Celsius for about 15 to 20 minutes. And if you want, you can flip them over during the time, but I actually haven't found it entirely necessary, but you'll just want to make sure that they get nice and crispy. Then in the same bowl, add the other half of the garlic and the Worcestershire sauce, the cracked pepper, the egg yolk, the fresh lime juice, kosher salt, and mix everything together. Then while you're stirring, slowly drizzle the olive oil in. It should just be a thin thread of olive oil constantly going into the bowl. Then add the Parmesan cheese and mix that in. And finally take the dry hearts of romaine and put them in the bowl and begin to coat them by gently turning them over and over in the dressing. So this is when the big bowl really comes in handy, otherwise you're going to be splashing Caesar dressing all over yourself, especially if you have a lot of leaves in there. And if you do have a lot of leaves, it, it also takes a little while to kind of make sure that they're all coated. So while Max from 20 minutes ago does that, Max from right now is going to tell you the history of Caesar salad. So deciding who actually invented the Caesar salad is, is a little rough. There are several claimants, but most historians agree that the salad takes its name from Caesar's Restaurante Bar in Tijuana, Mexico. The restaurant was opened in 1923 by an Italian immigrant named Caesar Cardini. Interestingly enough, he actually sailed over to America in May of 1913 on the RMS Olympic sister ship of the Titanic, which had sunk just a year previous. And it makes you wonder, if he had sailed over just a year earlier, would we have the Caesar salad? Anyway, after working in several restaurants in Sacramento and San Diego, he decided to open up his own place and he chose Tijuana for the location. Because with prohibition in full swing in the States, people were flocking over the border each day to partake in a bit of recreational drinking. On top of that, gambling was actually legal in Mexico at the time, so this city right across the border was basically like the Las Vegas of the 1920s. But even though the location of the first Caesar salad is pretty well established, who made it is not so clear because a lot of people who worked there in those early days have laid claim to actually being the one to invent it. There was Livio Santini, who in 1924, at the age of 18, moved from Italy to Tijuana, where he worked as a cook at Caesar's restaurant. See, according to him, during World War I, his family was put in a refugee camp in Austria. And while they were there, his mother would make what was called hard time salad, though I'm assuming in Italian. And basically, it was a salad that she would make with whatever she had available. It was olive oil, Worcestershire sauce, wine vinegar, Parmesan, and on occasion, an egg. And so he made that same salad when he started working at the restaurant. And he says that Caesar eventually started making it table side and kind of took credit for the salad and that's why it was named the Caesar salad. But to believe that, you would also have to believe that a boss would take credit for something their employee did. And I just, I don't see that happening. But the most accepted story does lie with Cardini himself. According to his daughter, it was a busy 4th of July weekend in 1924, and the restaurant saw every item on the menu 86th, meaning that they ran out of it in restaurant speak. 
Well, the hungry Americans, many of whom were rich, famous, and drunk, were clamoring to be fed. So Cardini, in a, in a you know, tizzy, goes back into the kitchen and just grabs whatever ingredients are left and decides to put something together. But the dish wasn't that spectacular, so he had a bit of a flair for the dramatic, so he decided to take a cart out into the dining room and actually put the dish together right there in front of everything. And he named it the Caesar Salad, or Caesar's Salad. So that's the story that he told his daughter, and it very well could be true. Though I have worked in a lot of restaurants and with a lot of restaurant owners, and the way that I imagine it probably happened was it was very busy, he was frazzled, and he went into the kitchen and went to his cook and said, hey, what do we have, what can we put together? His cook said, hey, we can, we can do this, make this salad. And he goes out of the dining room, he makes it, and he says, oh, I made this. But who knows, maybe I'm just a cynic. Regardless of how it actually happened, Caesar's name did end up on that salad. But that might not actually be the Caesar salad that ended up becoming really popular. Because shortly after its creation, Caesar's brother, Alex, came to work at the restaurant. Alex took that salad and added in some anchovies and possibly some Dijon mustard, and he changed the way that it was served. Originally, it was served basically big pieces of lettuce with the stems on the outside in a circle on a plate, and then everybody took it by hand and ate it kind of like a, a lettuce wrap or something. And, you know, he was like, well, people don't like eating salad with their hands, I imagine. Um, and so he said, no, we're going to get this with forks. This new method of serving, along with the anchovies and maybe some other ingredients added, became known as the aviator's salad because Alex had been quite the pilot in World War I. And eventually, story goes that it became far more popular than the Caesar's salad, so Caesar changed the name of the aviator's salad to the Caesar's salad. And yeah, I believe that because it's all about Caesar. But this is the salad that movie stars like W.C. Fields and Clark Gable popularized. And Caesars became the place to be seen. And years later, the great Julia Child wrote, One of my early remembrances of restaurant life was going to Tijuana in 1925 or 1926 with my parents, who were wildly excited that they should finally lunch at Caesars restaurant. My parents, of course, ordered the salad. Caesar himself rolled the big card up to the table, tossed the romaine in a great wooden bowl, and I wish I could say I remembered his every move, but I don't. It was a sensation of a salad from coast to coast, and there were even rumblings of its success in Europe. And you're welcome for not making you listen to that entire thing in my Julia Child impression. Now, legend has it that the way that the salad got to Europe was via Wallace Simpson, future wife of King Edward VIII, once he abdicated, of course. She's also often credited for being the one to request that it be cut up into smaller pieces of lettuce, making it easier and a little bit more dainty to eat with a fork, and frankly, I'm all about that. And even the master chefs of the International Society of Epicures in Paris voted the Caesar salad as the greatest recipe to originate from the Americas in 50 years. And I am tempted to agree with them, except that I have not tried this version of the salad and so I reserve judgment until I have done so. So once you've coated the romaine in the dressing, set several pieces on a chilled plate, and top with a bit more Parmesan cheese and the croutons. And here we are, one possible version of the original Caesar salad. I do have to say, eating like huge leaves like this, um, kind of weird. I agree with uh, Wallace Simpson or whoever decided that it needed to be cut up because it needs to be cut up. But what doesn't need to be cut up are the croutons. I'm going to try one of those first because I freaking love croutons. Now that is some crunch. Those are fantastic. I mean, there's just a little bit of garlic, like that hint of garlic, but it's not overwhelming. It's not like garlic bread, but a little bit like garlic bread. Now for the salad itself, I could use a fork, uh, be a little bit more civilized, but originally you picked up the whole thing of lettuce, so that's what I'm going to do. Here we go. It's actually pretty easy to eat that way. Um, it's really nice. It's super light. Like, I mean, obviously there's a ton of oil in it, but it doesn't feel oily. It feels really light. And there is this spice to it that I, I usually don't find in 
in many modern uh, Caesar salads, usually I feel like, because I like a creamy Caesar probably, so it's, it's much uh, more subtle. Um, I think it's coming from that Worcestershire sauce, but it doesn't taste like anchovies at all. Um, so if you really like the flavor of anchovies, you'll want to add anchovy paste or, or chopped up anchovies. But this is really great. I don't think it really needs the anchovies. It's just different, I suppose. So especially compared to like just a plain vinaigrette, and if you look at salad dressing recipes from like the late 1900s, early 20th century, they're all pretty, pretty basic. Um, this actually is a real step up, so I can see why it really caught on and was so popular. So I think that this version of the salad is really perfect for summer. It's, it, like I said, it's really nice and light. Um, you could put some chicken on it or whatever to, to spruce it up, but really it doesn't need it. It's, it's a whole meal on itself. I, I feel like I could eat all 20 leaves of, of lettuce. That's how, that's how light it is. Anyway, make sure to follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller. Also, check out our second channel, Catch Up with Max and Jose. We do some behind the scenes stuff, a little bit more about like my personal life and, and all that kind of stuff. Nothing, nothing too salacious, but uh, yeah. Anyway, check it out. I'll put a link in the description and I will see you next time on Tasting History.